everybody, a warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the place for accelerated inner growth and empowerment. I'm Janneke and today I'm super thrilled to be here with Christina Brees. Christina is the founder of University of Metaphysical Sciences, where they offer bachelor, master and doctorate PhD degrees. And I'm so excited to share that this is a school where I got my bachelor in metaphysics from. So this is very, very exciting for me. And uh, Christina is a well-known speaker, spiritual teacher. She's an author and a retreat facilitator. And she travels around the world helping people who are looking for their calling. And she's also um, having this retreat center that's called the Gaia Sagrada Ayahuasca Retreat Center, where the participants are able to experience plant medicine, such as ayahuasca, and we'll talk about that. And I also want to share that uh, what's going on behind the scenes on Wisdom from North these days, because the 3rd of February, I'm having again my Souls Calling online retreat. And this is a totally free event that I'm doing each year where we are actually diving into what our Souls Calling may be. And you'll be supported by me and some of my masterclass teachers from my membership where you are able to dive deeper into what your life mission and purpose is because I believe that if we are looking for our calling it is because there is one to find. So I'd love for you to join me. It is in the link below and I hope to see you there. And now over to you Christine. Welcome! How are you? Thank you for having me. It's my honor to be here. I've always admired your your work. It's so beautiful. Thank you for having me. Well, it's and my for being in school. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm so honored. I gotta say, when you contacted me, I was like, is she contacting me? I went to her school. <laughs> it's where it kind of started for me, and it was many, many years ago. And I had my bachelor in metaphysics, and I learned so much. And then you're telling me now that you contacted me, like in the beginning of Wisdom from North, and I didn't reply. I feel like a bit uh, embarrassed. Uh -huh. Don't worry, the timing's right. I was, I was like, well, okay, I guess she doesn't want to talk to me. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just I miss emails and it's just I'm sometimes a bit, uh, you know, all over the place. So, uh, but much more grounded now after having been on the spiritual uh, path for some time. Luckily. Me too. 10 years does a lot, right? 10, 15 years. I mean, the school's been open for 18, 19 years now. And I think it was like, really long ago like maybe 12 or 15 years ago <laughs> yeah whenever you started yeah and uh, and so divine timing spirit had its own plan <laughs> i know now it's the time i really trust that and there's so many things i wanted to speak to you about i think actually that we'll have to do several interviews because it seems like you can <laughs> speak about so many things and that's also what I learned in your school. Like I learned about all these different topics. And to be honest, I'm just realizing now that that has been my approach. And maybe that is colored by your um, the studies that I took uh, at your school. Mm -hmm. Because uh, now I have all these masterclass teachers in my membership covering different topics. So that's kind uh -huh. of my thing. <laughs> You know, it really is about covering a lot of different things because those of us who are helping people, we're helping people who are on all these different paths. And it's really important to know at least a little bit about every different method and every different path and every different faith and religion and or whatever, just so that we can help people who come from all these different backgrounds. So thank you for diversifying like this. It, it, that was my goal, was to give everybody a little bit of something and then get, of everything and then to, well, a lot of everything <laughs> and then uh, and then give them resources like if they wanted to dive deeper into any particular subject, they could. Right. So, yeah. And today I want to start with, we're going to, maybe if we have time, going to ayahuasca, astral, uh, plain and lucid living and but I want to start with spiritual contradictions because uh -huh. I watched this video on your YouTube channel and I was like oh yeah finally somebody is <laughs> addressing this 
Because yeah. a lot of the times I feel that many are looking for the answer. But, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, you know, this is the way. You, you cannot do that, but that is the way. And then we get confused mm -hmm. because all of a sudden two of our favorite spiritual teachers say something that's a bit contradicting. Mm -hmm. So I'd love mm -hmm. for you to share a bit about uh, your perspectives on spiritual contradictions. <laughs> well, I would say contradictions are good because it takes a lot of different types of teachers to help all the different types of people. It's all true. It's all true. It depends on what resonates for you as to what is true. Your truth may be different than another person's truth. What works for one person might not work for another person. For some, for some people, meditation works. Other people, they need to do walking meditation. Um, other people, they need to be doing some kind of art or dance. And that's just like, those aren't the greatest examples of, of a con I'm trying to think of a contradiction that would I be a great one. example. I have one. Okay. Okay. So to manifest, you need to surrender and let go. That's one side. Mm -hmm. To manifest, you need to focus your mind and your uh, intentions and visualize. It seems like there is a contradiction there. I'm going to throw a third one in. It's actually about vibration. It's not about any of that. It's, it's a, I'd rather call it, instead of the law of attraction, I'd rather call it the law of vibration. Because those both those methods work. Manifesting Simplified, that's a video I made about where just surrender your life to divine service and then the rest will follow. The rest falls into place and, and then you're led by following the clues to the next thing, what you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to manifest. And, and that worked for at that point in my life. And that'll work for some people at this particular point in their life. Stop all your human goals, stop all your plans, and just say, okay, I surrender my life to divine service, and then let spirit do what it's going to do with you. Now that worked at, a, at that particular point in my path because I was still very focused on succeeding in the material world. I was still so focused on, I've got to, I've got to manifest material, something or other to, to feel like maybe I'm, I'm manifesting something good. When in reality, at that time, just surrendering to divine service was just the right thing to do. Because um, I didn't really have a plan. I didn't really have a particular vision. I, I mean, I had a vague vision of what I wanted to do, but I didn't have the precise idea of what I wanted to do. So I, then I was, okay, I'm open to all the clues. Show me, show me what's the next clue, the next step. Now at that point, that really worked. All the visualization, it didn't work. All the, all the, the affirmations, it didn't work. It was just kind of empty because my, my vision wasn't precise enough at that time. Then I, the path unfolded and now I'm very precise about what I want to create, what I know what to do now. I, I mean, I'm well on the path now. The, the, the life work is totally manifested now and it's not a guessing game anymore. It's, it's, we're here. <laughs> and so then I can look at the subtleties. So what I would say about contradictions is that they work at specific times. One thing might work at a specific time in your path and might be just the right truth that you need to hear. And then at another time, and the completely the opposite might work. And so really, instead of looking at it as con contradictions, look at it as if, okay, this is the right time for this method to work for me. And later, another method might work because Everything is true, really. Ever, all these contradictions are true. This is the miracle of paradox, is that it's all true. And, but it's true at specific times. So instead of saying, this teacher's wrong, that teacher's right, this teacher's wrong, that teacher's right, instead say, well, at this point, this is the right thing for me, and I'm going to visit that thing later and see if that's true for me maybe three years from now. So, I love contradictions that. are good. 
Yeah, I love that you you were especially addressing the meditation part because mm -hmm. I think there are so many spiritual seekers around thinking, I have to meditate, I have to meditate, is the only way. And then it's kind of a taboo all of a sudden not to meditate or not to do yoga. For me, I've been like a bit shamed that I'm not doing yoga. Are you not doing yoga? But you're so spiritual. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> There's no supposed to. There's no supposed to. Right. Do what works for you. Uh, for instance, uh, my friend, he just loves listening to rock and roll and staring at a spot on the wall for, for an hour and... That's his meditation. He's in Nevada. <laughs> and, yeah. and that's what makes his mind still. Uh, he just loves the ripping lead guitar, and that just puts him in the zone. <laughs> Another person, they have to walk. It's, it, their meditation is walking. And sitting still in, in, in a lotus position or something for an hour, it's not going to work for that person. So whatever it takes for you to get into that still space, whether it's art, dance, listening to music you love, painting, playing with the dog, whatever it is, watching the water, you don't have to be just in stillness meditating, although that is the doorway to the universe within. I mean, it's powerful. It's a powerful tool. And I can't say that I could have become a dimensional walker if it wasn't for the, for the meditation. I don't know if I could have accomplished that with walking or art. So. So, so over to that, a dimensional, what did you call it? A dimensional? Dimensional walking, a dimensional walker. A lot of people are beginning to awaken to their abilities to be in the different dimensions and work in the different dimensions because... There's a lot of cleanup going on around the earth right now, and I kind of specialize in rounding up dark spirits and sending them home so, so that they can stop influencing humanity and stop being, being trapped in their own hell. They get in a consciousness loop and they get stuck. For instance, last night in a ceremony, I found this one hey, poor guy. He died working. He died at his computer, and he's still working. He doesn't know he died. And he's just like, blah, 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 working, working, working. And I'm just, I'm just holding this spirit right now because he can't wake up. I keep saying, look at me, look, look, wait, shh. Okay, and, okay. Um, Th to this try is to get a, this one to go home. This is like a huge topic I have to understand uh, because this frightens me a bit. Uh, so ah. You're saying that, um, or it might frighten others as well. Are you saying that souls can linger and if they don't oh, yeah. wake up, they will keep on lingering because I, I, I'm not fond of that perspective. I'm thinking that maybe a part of them is lingering, but another soul part is in higher realms. The soul part is always awake. The soul part, I mean, while we're a human, it's completely awake. Dreaming that human. And it can be dreaming that it's a spirit trapped in the other realms, too. It can be dreaming that it's a bad guy. It could be dreaming that it's a good guy. It could be dreaming whatever. But the so, so that's it's it's called soul retrieval when you have a stuck part at, at a point in my path I had to collect some of the parts of myself that were trapped at the end of a bad death or a bad lifetime or to, that was still haunting places. We all have these pieces of ourselves mm. that are kind of still caught between the worlds that haven't completely integrated back into the, the all that is. That and and these, these are just hurt parts. They're not evil. Even if they pretend to be evil, they pretend to be dark, all dark spirits are just hurt children. They are just her children that never got the chance to heal. And if you are the one who sees them, if you are the one who perceives them and has interaction with them, you for help. So help them, ask them, what happened to you? What, 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 how did you get so hurt? And do you want to go home? Do you want to end this consciousness loop, this, this, this consciousness that you got stuck in? You can go home and start a new life. And... When I first started this about maybe 15, 18 years ago, um, about only 25% of them said yes. And the other 75% would be like, get bigger and better and 
what? You're not scared? Try this. And I'm like, oh, come on. You know, let's get authentic here. I, I want you to heal. And if they say yes, a legion of angels comes in and takes them home. Because you can't take them home unless you give the body up. You can only get them to say yes, and then the angels come, the spirits that help people cross over, help souls cross over. They come and they take them home. And, and then they can choose a new life and, and assemble, uh, assimilate what had happened and, and make peace with it and continue the reincarnational path. And, but now, I would say maybe a little bit more than 50% of these souls say yes now. I live two lives. One, I live in the daytime. One, I live at night, rounding up dark spirits and taking them home. It's kind of my specialty. <laughs> so when and, you do this, are you then in the astral world? And how do you do yes. it? Is it within um, lucid dreaming you're doing it? I start there. I start there. Um, sometimes I do an astral projection right off the bat. bat but... Um, a lot of times I, I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, I do need to sleep. I need to get some rest. So it's better to fall asleep and then just let it happen from there. And then I still can only do it for a certain amount of time before I'm like, okay, now I have to rest. Um, but I, I'll spend some time each night, not every night, depends on how tired I am. <laughs> but, um, it's, it's, I work with a lot of spirit beings who are training me, have been training me for a long time. And any human who begins to have this spiritual power, this Siddhi, this spiritual power, they, they get called on to start training. And, and what we do is we hold space around people who are about to commit suicide to help them make a different choice. We help dark spirits cross over. We help stop murders. We say, hey, think about this, you know. If someone's about to commit a murder, we hold space. We hold space and just hold these angel wings around them and, and just give them a chance to not make a bad choice that's going to create a bad karma. Or shall we say karma is not a punishment system, but it's an educational system and to not create an educational moment that they don't need. <laughs> so, so, so what, what yeah. I feel is important to ask because uh, I'm noticing fear. She shows up uh, within me. I was just on this course, uh, fall in love with your fears. So I'm acknowledging my fear. But um, <laughs> when we die then, how do we uh, not end up like that guy on the computer? Do your spiritual homework in this lifetime. Just do your spiritual homework. Make peace with everything. Do your healing. Do your growth. Do your awakening. And when you get to the end, you're conscious. And you can choose consciously from an awakened place. And, and yeah, awakening is an ongoing eternal process. It's never really over. I mean, you can never really get fully enlightened. It's impossible. Because enlighten is a verb. And when do you stop? And it means to know. And when do you ever stop knowing more? Even after this lifetime, even for eternity. How do you ever stop knowing more about the nature of self, the mysteries of the universe, and who this vast consciousness is that you're part of? So it goes on. And, and the fear, I'm going to tell you a secret as to dealing with fear. This totally works. Change it into excitement because fear is the flip side of excitement. It's the same coin, but fear on one side, excitement on the other. And so if you really think about it, fear is kind of excitement about the unknown and what you're going to, what you can experience. I, I actually, as soon as when fear comes, I'm, off, I'm like, okay, how is this an adventure? How, how can I be excited about this? And yeah, it's a stretch. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to really stretch yourself to do this. But you can. And then you can use fear in the right way. Because fear is a flight or, fight or flight primal instinct. And if there's no danger, fear has its purpose. If, if the train's coming on the track, you're like, okay, i got to get off the track. Whoa, you know, fear, <laughs> run. Get off the track because something's going to hurt me. 
Um, but if there's nothing happening and you feel fear, this is a misappropriation of this energy. It's a powerful energy and it attracts dark spirits. And these dark spirits are influencing us all the time. And the, if you think human population is high, wait till you see the spirit world. It's highly po populated. Well, I've I seen that myself in my lucid dreams. Um, it, yeah, it was very crowded and it wasn't that easy to do any work there because I constantly got distracted. And yeah. for those who um, are new to lucid dreaming, I just want to explain that it is actually that you are awake in a dream. And from my perspective, we, when we sleep, we go into this astral world. Um, and I'm wondering, Christine, the astral world, uh, how do you see, see the astral world? Because many are saying that there are different levels of the astral world. Mm -hmm. um, it can be low vibrating and higher vibrations. And to me, it's not like, um, <laughs> I wouldn't say heaven, but you know, it's, uh, there are higher dimensions O not over but you know uh, above that or it's difficult mm -hmm. to find words to explain uh, so I'll just uh, put the ball uh, over to you uh, in your perspective what how does the astral world work and what is it well think of it like the earth there's beautiful places on earth heavenly places groups of people who are in heaven and there's hell places on earth it's all here in this reality. Same thing with the astral world. There's there's nice places and there's not so nice places, but they're all in the same in the same realm. It's just like there's nice places and not so nice places here in the in the physical reality, in the same realm. And so it's sort of like being a tourist. If you want to pick where you want to go, you have to have the vibration of where you want to go. You want to be in heavenly places in the astral world, then you have to hold a heavenly vibration in yourself. If you want to be in places that are challenging, let yourself be open to that in your vibration. And I personally visit the hell places in the astral realms because I want to help them come home. They don't have to stay in hell. They don't realize it. They don't have to stay in hell. And there are some spirits, I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes you're out of your league. <laughs> I've learned to just, when I'm out of my league, don't, don't mess with that. Um, for instance, one time I astral projected to the, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but like Council on Foreign Relations and Bilderberg Group and stuff like that, you know? And did you hear me? Not quite. Uh, okay, I'll just say it. Um, I also projected to the Council on Foreign Relations and, oh gosh, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, and, and Bilderberg Group, and I got there, and there were four really huge dark spirits, like, like guardian of the directions. And I was going to go and just put love in everybody's heart and try to just make all the leaders of the world just think good things for humanity and just put love and conscience and all this good stuff. And these, these spirits said, you turn around, little girl, or we're going to we're gonna devour you. And I was like, okay, I know when I'm out of my league. And so I left. But I was like, I'm coming back with a with a herd of love though. I'm gonna just keep building this love in this world because really that's how we're gonna change all that and love them too. There are her children who don't know that the leaders are not evil. They're they're damaged. Not all the leaders, some are really good. But you know, some are some are you know, some are brought up wrong and, and, and it's not their fault and, and this is their chance to have a Hitler lifetime. Uh, Sorry, everybody has to have what one. What did you say? And, the, <laughs> this is... and this is their chance to have a Hitler lifetime. Oh. <laughs> everybody gets one in order to complete the human education. You cannot complete the human education unless you have some bad guy lifetimes. Because this is how you learn about misuse of power. Misuse of power 101, 102, 103, 104, 110, 116, 100. You have to take all these misuse of power courses to know how to use power right. And as soon as you know how to use it wrong, you automatically know how to use it right. And so 
this and and the misuse of power takes a lot of lifetimes to complete it's not like you can complete this course of study which is advanced course of study for the soul this is not a beginner's course and it takes several lifetimes to complete the misuse of power study and and usually what it starts with is a perpetrator lifetime and then on then comes a whole bunch of victim lifetimes until at the end you enter a life of service enter the state of grace and you and, and you you change and and take this power back knowing that you're going to use it benevolently from now on mm -hmm. that's why people are afraid to take their power back because they know they can really hurt themselves if they use their power wrong wow because educational it's it's not punishment and reward this karma thing it's educational in the law land of uh, cause and effect so and this is only <laughs> on planet earth right uh, or in a sense or more like um it could earth. be in any dimension not just earth so because you got to learn how to use power in any dimension really okay uh, but is the Earth School a bit more like uh, challenging than perhaps other galaxies and other star systems? And <laughs> but it's not as challenging as some I've seen. I mean, I'd say this is somewhere in the middle. There's heaven, free, there's heaven realities, utopian worlds, and there's hell ones. And there's all. I mean. I've seen all over the universe just all these different versions of humanity and different species and, and the idea is to get God's consciousness into its dream, awake and aware in its dream. That's what this whole project is about, is to bring as much of this all that is consciousness into the picture, into the painting, into the physical reality. And every different version of Earth, it's almost like a Petri dish with a or version of humanities it's like a petri dish with okay we're going to throw these challenges at it and see how it evolves and then this one we're going to have these challenges and see how it evolves and all these different versions of evolution and what happened here was a cosmic accident there was a was it an it was accident a, not really but what <laughs> happened was the masters of space and time they used to scratch if there was like an accident like a meteor hit or a bacteria hit what happened was a meteor with a certain bacteria hit and that's what disconnected the 12 strands and the masters of space and time would be like okay the experiment got messed up so we're going to scratch it and start over now the, there came a point where they're like okay we're going to let these things run because this is meant to happen and let's see how the species evolves then if we allow this to continue its process and so now they're not considered accidents they're considered okay this is a cosmic event that we're going to let it play itself out and see what happens I have uh, I kind of went all over the place there, but... <laughs> I haven't uh, heard that uh, take on it before, but that's... Uh, wow, fascinating. I, I get curious about your abilities. It seems like you, you have these extraordinary abilities to see uh, things that the normal human being can't. Have you always had these abilities? No, I'm proof that you can work for it. <laughs> you know, so many people are like, oh, I've had them since birth and childhood and everything. I'm like, what about those of the people who have to work for it? Because I was so shut down as a child. I mean, I went through stuff people don't live through as a child. I mean, I had, I was like, all right, let's get 10 lifetimes worth of stuff done. And, and so I, I can finish the reincarnational cycle. This is, this is my last required one. It's a lot of people's last required lifetime, actually, right now, because a whole new yuga is coming, the Sat Yuga. The age of darkness is over, and the seasons are changing now. And those of us are kind of finishing up the process with the Kali Yuga, with the, with the dark yuga. And it, it takes a thousand years for this change. We're, about, we're into it about 200 years so far. And it takes about a thousand years for the yuga seasons to change. But um, 
but and a whole new kind of soul is coming in now to set the frequencies for a utopian world. If you notice some of these 20 year olds, it's like, wow, how did you get so enlightened? You're just like, <laughs> you don't even have to work for it. But those of us who are the indigo children, those are the crystal children and the rainbow children right now. Those of us who are the indigo children, we had the difficult pasts. We had the, the darkness to transmute. And I was so shut down. I had no spiritual powers whatsoever until I started meditating and starting started healing these traumas. I mean, I'm not going to go into the, the details of the story, but if anybody heard it, what had happened to me, they'd be like, how did you survive? Because this was the kind of stuff that happens and programs you to self-destruct or commit homicide, one or the other. Usually women kill themselves and men kill somebody else if they've gone through these kind of things. I mean, there was ritual sacrifice and rape and all this good, all the, all this, <laughs> I almost said almost all the, all this good stuff because you know what? I see it as my badge of courage. I see it now as my PhD and what qualified me to do what I do now because I can help people nobody else can help because some people just don't understand it. Like if a, if a guy raped somebody and he's got remorse and he wants to heal it or murdered somebody, I know how to help that person. Whereas other people are just like, Oh my God, I can't even talk to you. And, um, so I see it as something that gave me an understanding of, the psychology that's behind the perpetrator and behind it, that they're really hurt children. And, and I could have become one of those perpetrators easily in this lifetime if I didn't say, all right, that's it. I'm going to heal it. I, I just, I have to be my own doctor. I got to be my own shaman. I got to be my own guru because nobody could help me. I didn't have any money. And, you know, there's only a hundred self-help titles back in the eighties. So <laughs> I mean, I'm 54 now, almost 55, and there was no YouTube, there was no internet, if anybody can imagine that. There was no, there was no smartphones, there was no nothing. If, if you couldn't heal yourself, I mean, there were no spirit, maybe a few spiritual teachers, but who could travel to India or, or travel to California if you lived in, I mean, if you were, anyway. So the, the point is, is that I decided that I wanted to have my spiritual powers. I knew that all of us can have them. Everyone can have them if you want them bad enough and if you're willing to work for them. And so I just worked and worked. Well, what happened was the first time I meditated, I got a taste of all these spiritual powers. I had a beginner's luck, first thing, astral projection, lizard, blah, blah, blah. And then it all stopped. <laughs> and then within four days, I was just bawling for like, it was like opening a can of worms, this meditation thing. And I was just bawling for like the next 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this meditation thing actually is worse than I thought it was. <laughs> but, but it started the healing. And then I just gradually worked on the spiritual powers. And I'm proof that even though you've been shut down from childhood from having them, I'm proof that you can regain them or develop them if you didn't have them. Everyone has them. This is what the rest of the brain is for. We're only using 10% of it. Even 1% more gives you all these spiritual powers. When we're, when we're all hooked up, say, through the next 26,000 year cycle, when the 12 strands are all hooked up, this is what the other 90% of the brain is for, is for seeing the other 90% of the universe that we can't see, which is God's consciousness. There's 90% dark matter. Everybody's like, what is that stuff? It really is just part of God's consciousness that we are not, we don't have the software to see it yet. We have the wiring, it's all there, but we don't have the software yet. And that's what the next 26,000 years is for in the evolution of this particular species. So I, I think I've read all over again. <laughs> but yeah, spiritual powers, you can get them. You just got to work it. But read the astral projection technique books. Read the lucid dreaming. Here's a book I would totally recommend if you want to see Auras. You'll see them right away. Uh, Hands of Light by Barbara Brennan. That's the easiest spiritual power to get is aura, aura vision. I have and, that one. Yeah. 
so you know, you know the techniques work, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and those magic eye books, they'll help you develop the, the, there's three magic eye and it's just those books where it's just a bunch of static. But if you look at it like between the book and you, like into the middle of the space between you and the, and the picture, the 3D image comes out. That's the vision you need to be able to see auras. So just wanted to pass that on. If anybody wants their spiritual powers, that's the place to start. Because lucid dreaming and astral projection, those are more difficult to develop. And it takes a while. But lucid dreaming, just every day, every time you see something unusual, ask yourself if you're dreaming. The answer is always yes. And then it transfers into your sleep. And then and, and act like, oh, my God, everything's a dream. And, and it transfers into your sleep. And, and that's how you develop that one. Astral projection, that's going to take a lot of meditation work. There's no two ways about that. Um, I know. And then the spiritual it. scene, I honestly don't know how it works. I, I can't tell anybody, this is how I can see what's, what is her, harming a per, where, where a person's at, what their past lives are, what, what all this is. I mean, when I'm in the ceremonies or when I'm talking to people on the stage with the retreats, I just suddenly know all this stuff about them and I don't really know how it works. I'm going to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. It just is there. And I think it happened when I was in a, I was in a coma for three days about 20 years ago. And it was like a 40 year journey on the other side. And that's where I, I learned and saw all this stuff. And then when I came back, it was just there. So. I do believe you can develop it, though, and, yeah. and I think meditation is the way. Yeah. Because I was an avid meditator, so. Yeah. And um, Well, so. thank you for sharing that. I, I had no idea this about your story. Uh, maybe I forgot about it, but it, it um, wow. Wow. I didn't. I don't share it that often mm-hmm. about the path, the trip. I I usually only share it with people who are experiencing trauma themselves, because. Mm-hmm. It feels like such a past life to me now. It's it's really not at my forefront of my consciousness anymore. But I, I do but, I do see that then you're able to hold uh, or room much more uh, in a way or hmm, to approach darkness in a much more calm way. Because like I said in the beginning, uh, whoa, this scares me. Whoa, fear. But you're going mm-hmm. right in there. Uh, and I think it's something about that. Uh, that and not just and not just going in there, but embracing it. Embracing and, and it. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. I, I'm not there yet. I'm. Um, <laughs> I don't want to go too much into uh, the darkness because I'm afraid I will lose myself a bit in it. Uh, and it's just been a conscious choice. I know it's there in a sense, but I want to focus other uh, other places. <laughs> Well, if I could, I want to share, a, this is really quick, a little protection method yes. for I was just when you're in the to darkness. Ask you that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> if, the red yeah, if that's important to protect good us. transmit. <laughs> um, uh, it's really easy. Don't think about putting walls around yourself and protecting yourself. You're putting yourself in a box. The way I see it is dark spirits need protection from me. <laughs> because if they don't want to heal and they don't want to change and they can't experience the love and the embrace, then they're going to run away. They, they can't actually be in my presence. And the thing to do is to shine so much light, so much love, so much awareness that they literally have to either change or run. It's not that you need protection from them. They need protection from you Makes if they sense. want to start. Yeah. And I have to deal with a lot of dark spirits that show up at the ceremony sometimes because not only humans come to heal at these ceremonies, but dark spirits come too to heal at these shamanic ceremonies. And because there's healing on all levels going on. And the ones that want to make trouble, I turn into a dragon if I have to. But my first... <laughs> My first method is to just embrace them in love. And then they're like, yeah, get that stuff off of me, and they run away. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I mean, I think that what you went through, you're holding so much light, and thus you're able to actually hold more darkness and embrace the darkness. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I resonate with you. That's what I believe as well, that the more I raise my frequency, that will be my protection. So that has mm -hmm. in a way been my focus. I don't want to focus on the darkness. I don't want to focus on it. I'll just focus on how can I raise my vibration and then healing, you know, letting go, all that, embracing my fear, all that. So mm -hmm. it's not suppressed. So yeah. I want to, I know time is running, but I, I want to dive a bit into ayahuasca and plant medicine because this is, uh, I didn't know that you were doing it. So I was like, oh, exciting. I've had an interview about this before and I see that it's coming up more and more that YouTubers, uh, spiritual YouTubers are talking about it. More and more people are trying it out and it's controversial. And some teachers are saying that that's an escape, you know, that's like a fast track to a spiritual experience, but then you're not doing your real work. And others are saying, this is dangerous, you know, you can lose your mind. You never know how, some call it drugs, or how plant medicine, what it can do with your mind. Uh, mm -hmm. So what are your perspectives on it? And why are you, you know, why is it important for you to have plant medicine as part of your work? Well, thank you for for voicing all those things because those are real concerns for people. But if they haven't been working with the medicine, they don't really understand what it's for. I'm going to be honest with you. I believe that psychedelics are possibly the next religion <laughs> because it really puts you in touch with the master within. Uh, first, I'm going to qualify this by saying that there's a lot of unqualified people giving the medicine who are not shamans. They have not been trained. This is an art form. This is this is like becoming a doctor. It's usually a seven to eight year process to really become a shaman. And you have to be in thousands of ceremonies to truly know how to handle it. I've been in thousands of ceremonies and I've kept fire, my training, helping the people. And now I've been given the blessing to carry the medicine by the elders because they can see that I do it well and, and they respect what I'm what I what I do. And I'm gonna be honest with you, the medicines are kind of the shortcut. I mean it just cuts through all the crap. I mean in two weeks, when people come to a retreat here, it's like 20 years of psychotherapy in two weeks. It just bypasses all the mental gymnastics, it bypasses all the, all the defenses, all the strategizing to defend your limitations. <laughs> you know, it just, um, it just cuts right to the core of the matter. And there's just nothing, the medicine just takes away all the, all the programming, really. I mean, well, not that it takes away the programming, because that takes work, but it shows you so clearly what the programming is that it would take years of meditation, really, to discover some of these things. And I'm going to be honest with you, the medicine isn't for everybody. Not everybody's called to the medicine. It has to be people who are really called to it. It doesn't work for people who it's not called to. For instance, somebody's like, my kid needs this, or my parents need this, and they'll pay for a retreat and send them down. I say, don't do that. If they're not into it, if they're not called to the medicine, if they're not like, yeah, I really want to try the medicine, then it's not it's not for them. That's And I want to tell everybody, the medicine, ayahuasca and San Pedro, mushrooms, all of it, this is not the spiritual path. It's a spiritual tool on the spiritual path. Just like meditation is a spiritual tool, yoga is a spiritual tool, therapy and counseling is a spiritual tool, you name it, there's all these spirituals. So is ayahuasca and San Pedro, it's a spiritual tool. And what it is, is, is to show you what your next steps to work on is, and then without the medicine, you have to go and do your spiritual homework and, and apply this into your life. Some people want to do it too many times. They're using it as an escape. Some people do use it as an escape because they just like all the pretty colors and the psychedelic woo-ha. I'm going to be honest with you. The visuals are a surface level of the medicine. The visuals are actually a distraction. And sure, enjoy them for the moment that they're there. But as soon as the visuals start going down, don't be like, oh, more visuals. That's the aha moment 
those are the aha realizations. That's the moment for those. So you're going to have these aha realizations about your life. That's the time to ask the master within you the questions. That's the time to really set, work on your intentions and what you're healing and what you're trying to attain. And it's not about the psychedelic journey. So some people don't understand that. And I'm going to tell you the difference between drugs and medicine. Drugs are an escape. Drugs are to hide what you're trying to heal and learn. Medicine is for healing. And if these are you, these substances are used for healing, then they're being used in the right way. If they're being used for recreation, if they're just for play, then they're not being used as a spiritual tool that they are. Mm. So that's what I would have to say about that. I think you said something else. Um, yeah, I was wondering, can it do something to the brain where you can click? Like, I think I would be afraid that, well, what if I get insane? Because I was <laughs> that one person that didn't, you know, somehow the medicine or it was wrong for my brain. Yeah. Uh, this medicine does not work for psychosis and it does not work for schizophrenia. Anything like those kind of where basically those people are standing on the edge of a dimension but don't know how to handle the spiritual power that they have. They have a spiritual power that to see the spirit worlds and be influenced by the spirit worlds. But because they don't know how to handle this spiritual skill, and I'm going to make a course on how to handle this spiritual skill because there's I don't think there's a course out there for how to handle dimensional walking. I'm going to make some dimensional walking courses because the spiritual powers are awakening in people now, but there's no instructions. And so these people are standing already on the edge of this dimension, but they haven't got the skills. And so the dark spirits come and prey on them because they're easy prey. But these medicines, are not good for that condition mm -hmm. if someone doesn't have a, a conqueredness of their fear, so to speak, or knowing how to use fear or confusion or easily influenced. There has to be... So those people can get crazier. I've seen that, that, that these medicines will inflame those conditions. So anybody with psychosis or schizophrenia, do not do these medicines. You're already there. Yeah. <laughs> You're already in the other dimensions. Huh. So, but for people who don't have these conditions, this opens the veils to the other dimensions. This opens the doors to these, this vast universe inside you. It's sort of like putting on these training wheels and then eventually, it, and it's a preview to the movie. These medicines are just a trailer, like a minute and a half trailer for a movie, for a two hour movie. These medicines are just a trailer, just like a preview to show you what your consciousness can do without the medicine. And then after you've taken the medicine, you've seen what your conscious can, can do and you've seen what is possible. Then comes the work in ordinary reality to, to work with this consciousness and make it I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't need medicine anymore. I'm kind of always, <laughs> I'm kind of always tripping, <laughs> you know. Just and in a good way, you know. All the colors are very vibrant for me. The I can see energies. I, I literally have to shut it down sometimes because the world is so vibrant to me. The I can I can feel everything the way that I do with the medicine. And I'm gonna be honest with you. I've gone further with meditation than I ever have with medicines. But the medicines were profound in the beginning of my spiritual path to show me what the meditation was going to do. And so I would suggest to everybody just use it as a preview. If you're doing it too much, you're going to actually shut down the facilities. And I'd say maybe... One to three times a year, is a retreat like this is enough at the most. Really, once people get the gist of it, they do like a once a year reset button and to get some more divine. 
But once you have the connection to the divine, you don't need the medicine anymore. You don't need the medicine. You never needed it, but it, it helps because it's like a intense meditation. For an amateur to have an intense meditation like that, that they didn't have to work for for 20 years, it's a blessing. It's a real blessing. And you don't go crazy if you have good facilitators. People who have lost their minds and never really came back is because they weren't in a protected space. They weren't with professionals who know how to do this. It, I can't stress this importance enough. Be with somebody who has led ceremonies as a shaman, as a professional, has been trained and really knows what they're doing and you'll be safe because they have to protect the space with the spirits. When people go crazy, it's because usually a spirit attach, attaches to them. And um, people who don't know how to hold that space and, and keep the space protected, I, I'm sorry, but it's a reality now. It really is, I mean, sometimes people come to South America, they take, they do three ceremonies and think they're a shaman now, and they take the medicine and give it to people. and. I get emails every week, like two or three times a week from someone who's like, I want to be a shaman. How do I learn how to be a shaman? Can I come there and learn? And at first I didn't want to do it because I was some really weird people want to be shamans. <laughs> so, so, but you know what, what I've learned, for instance, with the university of metaphysical sciences, one time my staff, emailed me and said, you know, this person's really crazy. I don't know if they should hold a, one of our degrees. And I'm, so I said, all right, let me, let me meditate on this. And, and I just sat down and meditated. And what spirit showed me was like, look, if they earn the degree, let them have it and just let spirit take care of the rest. Let spirit, if they're qualified, they'll get clients. If they're not, it's going to sit on their wall. And so I think the same thing with shamanism is that People who are qualified, people who are skilled, they're going to be given the chance to, to help people. If they're not, they're going to struggle to, to make it happen. And, and they have to do enough. Of it. And plus, once they go through our program, they're going to have done a lot of spiritual work. You saw what kind of spiritual work we do with the University of Metaphysical Sciences. Same thing with the Gaia Sagrada Shaman School. Um, it, it's a long process. It's going to be about a three year program and they're going to have to do a lot of spiritual work to qualify for it. There's vision quests, there's sun dances, there's being in a lot of ceremonies, there's fire keeping and, and seeing how it all goes down and how every kind of situation is handled. It's not about just singing the songs and smoking the tobacco at the right time and all of that stuff. That's surface level stuff. The, and if you really want to know the truth, what really qualifies someone to be a good shaman is all about the heart. It's, it's, it's all about the heart. And if they don't have a good heart, they have no business being in this business. So uh, that's going to be the qualifying factor. And if they develop the heart, then yeah. I feel that it's better that they're at least trained because the medicine wants to go all over the world now. And right now there's a lot of amateurs who, if there was a place to study, they would, but there's no place to go really to learn how to be a shaman in the correct way. And a lot of people come to our center, Guy Sagrada, and say, wow, I've been to all these other centers and you know some really big famous ones and you guys do it better than everybody. So, and I've never been to another center, so I don't know what they look like or how they go. I just followed directions from spirit and somehow it came out right. So it just feels like there's a responsibility to the medicine to train the people who want to carry it, who are willing to put in the time and have the integrity to truly learn. And there's a lot. If they had the chance, they would learn. And this way they know ethics, how to be with people, 
they they know how to handle certain things that come up with the medicines all of that so but there are some uh, good shamans I, I i'm thinking it comes from that indigenous cultures and they have you know that real long tradition of how to become a right. shaman it's just i feel like there are so many like semi shamans that you know and especially in the western world we we don't have any tradition uh so i think uh, yeah that would be awesome we lost our traditions. The the witches were the shamans in the white culture. I, we lost our shamans. We lost our traditions. And that's why so many white people now are trying to rediscover their connection with the earth, rediscover these traditions, because they oh, we lost something really important in, in our history with the witches and the burnings. And, and that was actually not about religion. It was about greed because women were starting to be powerful. They were starting to own land. They were starting to get rich being the doctors. And, and that's why that all happened. It wasn't about religion in case anybody didn't know. <laughs> but that's how we lost our, our traditions. And so... It's time now for the white people to rediscover these traditions and this connection to the earth and this connection to the master within themselves that the medicine helps them discover. Sometimes people think they're going to meet the medicine. No, you're going to meet the master within you. That's what the medicines are for. It's not to meet the medicine, not to meet Mother Ayahuasca. If you ask Mother Ayahuasca, who are you? It's going to show you that it's you. It's you know, the master within you. And so it's time for the white culture to rediscover this ability to reach and, and magic mushrooms were the medicine of the witches <laughs> so wow this is so fascinating uh like i said christina when, because our skype dropped out like it's been a long time since i've been going into the fringe like this and really going <laughs> into the you know uh, i don't know esoteric stuff but uh yeah maybe it dropped out because what we were talking about <laughs> <laughs> Very fascinating, and I would love, love, love to interview you again and collaborate some more. Because um, uh, I really feel like you have such depth in your teaching and such wide uh, knowledge and so much deep wisdom. So I was just honored to be here with you today, and thank you so much for all the amazing work you're doing. And for everybody who's watching, check out the University of Metaphysical Sciences. It's such a heartful place. Uh, I'm still so proud of my bachelor degree and my uh, bachelor assignment that I did. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, Christine. Tell, tell them about your bachelor assignment, your song. Yeah, I made a song. Uh, it was many years ago and I had met, never written a song before. And I wrote the song and I made a video, like a music video, and I, I was pretty proud of it. Uh, is it then, online? Can we see no, it anywhere? No, 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 no. no this is <laughs> private. It's private. <laughs> but, um, oh, you know, now it's coming back to me. I actually, I think I actually used it for my Wisdom from North song at, in the beginning, and I got it recorded, and I... But, but I use some different lyrics and stuff like that, but the, the melody was that song. I had forgotten about that. Yes, I will put the link to it. Would you share it with me? Yes. I will see. Yes, <laughs> I will. I will definitely. All right, thank uh, you so thank much. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you. And thank you for watching, everybody. And remember to subscribe to both our channels. And remember to shine the light that you are. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, please subscribe and click the thumbs up and click the bell in order to get notifications of my new videos. Now I also have a free gift for you. If you want to become a conscious co-creator, you can click on my free meditation below called Meet Your Future Self, where you have the possibility to co-create with the highest future version of you.